Um, I'm over at Rush uh, Medical Center, and let's get this started. A little bit about me, just so that you know where I'm coming from and what my qualifications are. So I'm a Southern California boy, I'm born and bred and educated and worked there for um, a long time up until um, just a few months ago um, when moved out here uh, to Chicago to follow my wife. Uh, my wife is Dr. Lynn Waterhouse. Um, she's one of the research biologists at the Harther Center right there at the aquarium, hence the, the, the link uh, between us. Um, so I did my undergrad at UCLA um, there in Southern California. And then I moved uh, to San Diego where I spent the next 15 years. Um, I did my med school, grad school, residency in emergency medicine, and then a subspecialty um, fellowship in hyperbaric and undersea medicine there. Um, so I am board certified in both emergency medicine as well as hyperbaric and undersea medicine. Um, I worked as faculty at UCSD uh, and currently, like I said, I'm at Rush. So just as uh, proof um, that I am who I say I am, um, and then I know a little bit about hyperbaric and diving medicine. Um, that's me on the bottom right. I'm treating a patient who is um, uh, transferred from the ICU for hyperbaric treatment for an arterial gas embolism, um, and not related to diving. Um, and I'm giving the thumbs up here because he's actually doing better and improving quite a bit. Um, and this is our chamber here at UCSD. It's a multi-place chamber, so chambers come in two different flavors. There's a monoplace chamber, which is um, kind of like a glass single person coffin. Um, and then the multi-place here, which ours is um, it's not huge, but it accommodate, accommodates about six uh, people that we could treat at one time um, if they're sitting, uh, plus a tender. Um, uh, so I'm about 6'1", six, 6'2", six, and I can't quite stand straight up in here, hence why I'm bending down. So I'll give you an idea about the actual space. So uh, currently I'm involved in dive research um, on the left here, um, and I try and be uh, a subject in my own diving research, by the way. Um, so here I am um, as a subject, we're doing a rebreather study looking at a hypoxia signature as well as cognitive function. I'm here surrounded by colleagues and friends who are helping me run the study. Over here on the right side is a um, part of a much larger study that I'll be talking to you guys a bit about. Um, that's going on in Mexico. Um, the two principals uh, involved in that study are actually here, this gentleman to my right, named Walter Chin, um, and uh, he currently works in Emory uh, in Georgia. And then this gentleman who has volunteered to be my subject for a cardiac ultrasound and echocardiogram. And this is Dr. Oswaldo Huchimalara, who's based down in Merida in Yucatan. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about them and some of our work down there. I am also an AUS certified science diver. Um, so I got my science um, diving certification when I was doing my fellowship. Um, I did a course through um, SIO here, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Um, and it's about two weeks. Um, I, so it was 12, day, 12 days of actual coursework in 14 days. And it's no joke. Um, so I am, I'm not a stud swimmer or anything like that, um, but I actually had to train swimming um, to be ordered to, in order to pass the, the test. They have a bunch of benchmarks um, before you could even get started in the class. Um, you do have to be open water certified. And then from there, you'll get um, all the way up to NAWI rescue trained, as well as Nitrox. Um, you do all kinds of um, cool, crazy stuff. Um, uh, in pools, off boats, things like that. So it was a really intensive course, um, made me a much, much better diver, um, and then opened up the world of science diving to me. Um, so since that time, I've primarily done my science diving in the aquarium, uh, Birch Aquarium is its name, uh, in San Diego. Um, and you can see it served as Santa Claus here um, with a big black uh, sea bass here. Um, my wife, Lynn Waterhouse, has accompanied me on a lot of these dives. Um, and I threw this this picture here. Conveniently, by the way, I'm, I'm drawing your attention away from the Easter Bunny photo here. Um, we'll leave that one aside. Um, but uh, on this one, the, the giant black sea bass was actually uh, sucking up my beard um, in retaliation because I didn't free her, uh, feed her fast enough. Um, the only problem with that is my regulator is trapped by my beard, so she is actively <laughs> trying to kill me underwater. Um, but we sorted it all out, and I got her food. 
So a um, month ago, um, I was walking through Costco doing my standard COVID shopping, um, like once every two to four weeks, um, and came across this um, site, which made me quite um, sad. Um, so uh, this was dried sea, cuc sea cucumber that was marketed um, at $54 a pound. Um, wild caught um, from Canada. And it was uh, just disappointing to me. Um, I, I, I'm, I think Costco has a reputation for selling sustainable um, seafood, but I'd argue that this isn't super sustainable. Um, and at least from the fishing practices that I've seen, um, it, it, it certainly isn't. Um, and I'll get to more um, as to why I was sad to see this there. And I bet by the end, you guys will probably be sad as well. So that brings us to the question. Um, the original question is what do sea cucumbers have to teach about um, diving medicine? I just wanna pause here really quickly and say thanks to Walter Chin. He's one of um, my collaborators um, who uh, supplied a lot of the videos and some of the photos and the graphics um, that I'll be using upcoming in the presentation. So um, sea cucumbers are fished lots of different places around the world, um, but I'm gonna focus on Mexico. Um, today, that's where we've been doing this study, um, and more specifically in the state of Yucatan. Um, so that's on the peninsula here, um, and it's this, um, this state here, right, in Mexico. And these are your answer um, as to this question that I've been talking about, about the link um, between sea cucumbers and dive medicine. Um, so these are artisanal fishermen um, down in, off the coast of Yucatan. Um, and they're diving fishermen. They do all kinds of fishing though. I love this photo because uh, this shows the type of people that they are. Um, they do love their work. Um, uh, they're happy. They like to joke around a lot. Uh, it's been almost about a decade um, since uh, Dr. Uchim Lara and um, Walter Chin got together and started studying these guys. Um, they were a little bit hard to access and to get buy into um, and allowing us to come down and study them and their dive behaviors and what they do. Um, but uh, they've, uh, they've really come to, to, to um, uh, welcome us um, and embrace us quite a bit and they've become um, friends. So uh, this is, um, I just wanted to show you guys a typical fishing setup um, that they'll use down there. So this fisherman is preparing bait here um, and you can see his boat. This is an open cockpit panga here. Um, and this right here, a little bit under um, this plastic bag is a jerry rigged uh, air compressor that'll, press, uh, that'll supply um, uh, compressed gas to a diver who will um, dive uh, in order to go fish. Sorry. And so um, to bring the map um, further into focus and focus on the state of Yucatan. Um, so many of you guys uh, will be more familiar with probably the Riviera Maya, starting with Cancun and going down to Tulum here, Playa del Carmen, Cozumel, the Mesoamerican Reef, um, which starts around right here and goes all the way to um, Honduras. Uh, the second largest uh, barrier reef in the world um, after the one in Australia. Um, really awesome place to dive. Um, so where we're going to be focusing on is a little bit um, further north and further west. Um, so along the coast right here, primarily the fishing villages of Rio Lagartos, which is where we have the um, the most um, ties um, to the fishermen and the fishing cooperatives there, San Felipe El Cuyo. The nearest hyperbaric chamber and medical facilities just in general, although they're still pretty rudimentary, are in the town of Tizimin here. And then further away, further west, is the much larger town of Merida. Um, really, really beautiful area all throughout here. Some of you guys may have done some cenote diving through here. This is the Mayan heartland. There's fantastic topside um, activities, uh, Mayan ruins, a lot of culture, a lot of festivals, um, really, really good food too. Beautiful, beautiful place. Highly recommend um, going there if you ever get a chance. So on a global scale, about a third uh, of the world's um, fishing catch um, by tonnage is produced um, through small scale fisheries. Uh, about another third are through large scale fisheries um, for food. Um, and then down here on the bottom right, um, 
uh, another, the last third um, will be used for other things like fish meal oils, that sort of thing. And this is according to the UN, which has also identified that uh, approximately 90% of all fishing jobs are considered small scale. So this is what I'm talking about here. Um, the open cockpit, the ponga here with the outboard motor. Um, there's a compressor, kind of this green thing um, sitting further um, up towards the bow. Um, and then the diver going off the edge, um, this time with a spear gun, looking to spear some fish. Looks like he was successful um, down here. Um, and you can see the setup um, with the hose there. Pretty simple. Um, here he is uh, underwater, the hose is running here. He's got a little safety tether um, to his weight belt here, um, which may or may not be filled with lead. They'll use whatever is available there. So other pieces of metal or concrete, um, the hose wraps around there. He's got his regulator, his catch here. What you won't see um, is a BCD um, and then definitely no dive computers. These guys are not diving dive computers. And this is the technology that makes it all happen. Um, so this is a jerry-rigged um, air compressor uh, using a locally welded volume tank here. That's got a whole set of problems, uh, carbon monoxide, uh, oil contamination inside. That's a whole nother talk, but basically um, these things far exceed um, OSHA regulations for anything that you would see in the States or what's considered a reputable um, recreational dive shop around the world. So let me take you guys to the town of Rio Lagartos, so the fishing port of Rio Lagartos. So this is the, during the sea cucumber fishery, so these guys fish year round. Um, and here they are starting their day during sea cucumber season. Um, so they usually start in the morning, blow up the guts, um, get ready to go out to the fishing grounds. It takes a little bit of um, watering to get out and to get around some. Um, I'm not holding me a to do the fishing. Um, I'm on a We've got these cool rivers going in, still here catch. Pretty exposed. You know, usually be one diver going down, no safety diver, nothing like that. Diver will dive down. There's a hose man who's beating out the hose. And then, because the cucumber are sessile, they're going to pick up. So, they're just going to go after and try and catch as many as they can. There are some regulations for how much they can catch quotas and things like that. Generally, they're trying to catch as much as they can. And they'll bring it aboard. In a second here, and you'll see their setup with the, this compressor. Basically, they're going to take a sea cucumber that diving um, underwater, um, many of you guys will have seen, looks like this, into something that looks like this. And only then will the sea cucumber be weighed and the fishermen um, paid out. And so just in case you think that this is a, a trivial matter and a very niche um, fishery and not that big of a deal, um, it is actually uh, some big money. So down on the right here, this is a headline that I was aware of um, before I left San Diego from 2018, um, where a father-son team of smugglers admitted to smuggling $17 million worth um, across the border illegally to go to markets in Asia. Um, and they were sentenced to probation and a $1 million fine. You can see up here, there's a border patrol agent who went to jail for smuggling, a restaurateur, jail, um, a sea cucumber kingpin even. And then here, in case you don't read Spanish, um, this is a, a headline from the por port of El Cuyo um, from 2015, um, where they had a, an armed robbery that stole 3.5 um, tons of the dried sea cucumber. So big, big money. Um, 
Now the fishermen, uh, they will also fish for other things, um, other, uh, other sources of protein um, and income. So they primarily fish for whatever pays um, and whatever they can eat. So the sea cucumber fishery only lasts uh, a few weeks um, out of the year. Their longest fish fishery is actually lobster here. Um, that'll last upwards of seven months. They'll also fish for octopus um, and things like grouper. Some uh, like uh, the lobster, they'll use um, the hookah system, the, the surface applied uh, compressed gas, um, but they'll also use hooks um, and even setups uh, for octopus too. Uh, but just a reminder and why I'm here talking to you guys is that um, fishing, and this type of fishing does come with the cost. These guys have higher rates of propulsion sickness. They are see. Can you guys hear me okay now? Is this a little bit better? If we go back. Yeah, maybe just. Hang on, let me. I can't see the. All right, I'm going to keep going then. Can you just mute the video? So. So I'd like to tell you guys about um, a uh, one particular case here um, that's going to illustrate a lot of the problems with uh, with fishing um, down there. So this is a fisherman who ultimately ended up permanently disabled as a result of a hit that he took. Um, so I have permission to use this photograph. I took this photo um, uh, of these two gentlemen. Um, the fisherman is the gentleman on the right here. Um, who sustained the hit, and then the gentleman on the left um, is Dr. Tech, who's the, the treating physician in TZ Mean, where there's the hyperbaric chamber. So the gentleman on the right is a 32-year-old uh, man who is originally from the port of El Cuyo, um, along that, um, that northern coast of Yucatan, and he, previous to um, the episode that I'm going to talk about, had suffered 10 prior hits of decompression sickness, DCS, um, and the 10 prior hits means that those were 10 prior treatments in the hyperbaric chamber. He's probably been hit with um, low grade decompression sickness many more times than that. Um, he had more than 10 years of diving experience and fishing experience. And on this particular episode, he dove to approximately 22 brazos, which are arm's lengths. So like I mentioned before, they don't use dive computers. So how they measure depth there is um, they measure how many arm's lengths it takes for the fishermen to um, stroke down and get to the bottom where they're going to be doing their fishing and their diving. Um, we use an approximation of about 1.5 uh, meters per brazo, um, which gives us a, a depth of about 100 feet of seawater. He was down there, they think, for about 60 minutes, which if you consult the, the old school dive tables, depending on which one you consult, it gives you a no deco, no decompression limit of approximately 22 minutes. So he obviously sustained a um, pretty provocative dive and a, he had a pretty big violation of the no deco limit. Um, and these fishermen, they don't um, do safety stops. Um, their motivation is to hurry up and unload their catch um, and to move on to another fishing site or to go back to port and offload their catch because the day is done. Um, so he ascended rapidly. Um, afterwards on the boat, he developed vertigo, vomiting, trouble breathing, leg numbness, leg weakness. Uh, he had uh, total body pain and general malaise. So he was then transported to TZ Mean to undergo um, recompression therapy um, using hyperbaric oxygen. 
So uh, as a further explanation of what that entails, so um, he was out at sea, so they had to make the, the trip to the port, Rio Lagartos, and then from there, he was gonna require a 53 kilometer transport, um, which is 45 minutes to an hour or so. Um, and that's gonna be probably by private vehicle, um, probably from a friend or um, the, uh, the president or other officer of the fishing cooperative. Um, they don't have EMS or any sort of rescue services or anything like that. Um, and then uh, he would probably have access to um, surface uh, oxygen, but that's not 100% guaranteed. So after the first hyperbaric oxygen treatment, um, he actually got worse. Uh, he had worsening leg weakness to the point where he was pretty much flaccid. Um, he had trouble emptying his bladder, so having urinary retention, and required multiple other hyperbaric treatments, um, and then down the line, a lot of physical therapy. He had an MRI that ultimately showed the equivalent of a stroke, a hypoxic infarct in his spinal cord um, at the level of um, T8 through T10, so in his thoracic uh, spinal cord there. So when I saw him, he was about a year after his injury, um, and he was able to walk. He was ambulatory, but definitely with a limp, um, and he was no longer diving. He was essentially disabled. Uh, his ultimate diagnosis was spinal cord decompression sickness, or what we'll call type 2 DCS. So let's review some diving physiology here really quickly, and sorry if you guys all know this, but I think it's really important to... Um, remember um, why DCS is a risk um, with diving. So we've got an old school um, uh, diagram here, but it works really well and does a good job of explaining it. So in gassing or on gassing, so if we start diving, um, the increased pressure is gonna basically lead to a lot more molecules of gas. And when I say gas, primarily we're talking about nitrogen um, and inert gases. So, and so for most of the diving that's done, again, that's gonna be nitrogen. Uh, and so that's gonna dissolve and go from the lungs into the blood, um, and then with time, will eventually make its way into tissues. Um, and if we were to do a saturation dive, all of these compartments will be e equivalent here, um, denoted by this double-headed arrow. So you'll receive, achieve equilibrium here. Um, if we were then to um, start making our way towards the surface, that's gonna happen in reverse, um, where we're gonna develop um, this diffusion gradient that hopefully is going to go out through the lungs, but maybe overcome. Or, sorry, let me re rephrase. So, the lungs may not be able to keep up with basically off gassing, in which case you might cause some bubbles. So, this is a complex graph, uh, and I'll simplify things. Um, this is used in dive planning. So you can see it's partial pressure of nitrogen, and this is in atmospheres absolute here, and it's plotted against time with this black line here denoting a, a scuba dive to say about 70 some odd feet of seawater with a little surface, uh, excuse me, a little safety stop here before um, reaching uh, close to the surface here. And all of these here are different tissue compartments and they're denoted these numbers um, to indicate how, how quickly they take on um, this nitrogen. And I won't delve too deeply into this, but the point of this is to show that there are different tissue compartments that will take on the nitrogen at different rates. So you can see this red thin line, it's gonna almost come to an equilibrium before the dive is complete. So that's a fast compartment. And so it's fast on, and then it's gonna come fast off, but not symmetrically. And somewhat similarly, but a lot more slowly, you're gonna have a slow compartment here, which is never really gonna reach equilibrium. It's gonna plateau and then start making its, uh, its way back down, but much, much more slowly. And so on to decompression sickness. So if there's a rapid reduction in pressure, such as there's inadequate time for the elimination of nitrogen from tissues, that nitrogen can come out of solution and form bubbles. And this is what we always worry about. And so DCS, decompression sickness, it, it arises when bubbles form from the dissolved inert glass in blood and or tissues. And then it's during or after a decrease in environmental pressure 
and it's going to show up in compressed gas divers, aviators, astronauts, tunnel workers, anybody who works in a compressed uh, gas environment where ambient pressure is increased, um, excuse me, where the local pressure is increased relative to some other pressure, usually sea level. So vascular bubbles, what's the big deal with that? Well, there's two problems with bubbles. There's physical obstructive effects, and then there's shearing effects from the bubbles tearing up uh, tissue going through um, the circulation. So here's a diagram where a bubble is modeled going through an artery here. Um, and as far as obstruction, so if this bubble were to stop here, maybe there's a constriction up ahead here and this bubble can't pass through here, it's going to obstruct the flow through here and it's going to cause something similar to a vapor lock. And so downstream here, whatever tissues down here that's dependent on oxygen, receiving oxygen from these arteries, isn't going to be able to receive that oxygen. It's going to undergo oxygen stress and potentially die. In turn, um, this uh, obstruction can show up also in the lymphatic system. So the lymphatics are similar to the sewers in streets. They take out a lot of waste um, and they move slowly. And so there can be something called lymphatic DCS or lymphatic bends that leads to divers having swelling in really odd places. Um, and that's an obstructive effect. That's the thought right now is that it's caused from, from obstruction of the lymphatics. And then these bubbles can cause damage to these endothelial cells. Um, these are the cells that line the inner part of the arteries here, um, cause uh, some damage through shearing, which then sets off a whole cascade of things. So it'll activate platelets and make forming blood clots much more likely. So activate the coagulation cascade. If these um, endothelial cells are damaged in small, small blood vessels, um, they can cause uh, leakage of, of fluid across through here. And that fluid will end up in the surrounding tissue and cause swelling or what's called edema, particularly nasty in the central nervous system in the brain. Um, and so here's this inflammation and vasogenic edema. So um, this edema is that swelling I was talking about. Big, big problems from uh, bubbles going through the vasculature. So decompression sickness, DCS, is a clinical diagnosis. I don't have a blood test, um, an MRI, any sort of objective data that I can prove to you that a, a certain diver has decompression sickness. So we have to make the diagnosis of decompression sickness based on history and physical exam primarily. So DCS, um, the most common scheme of grading it and grading its severity is um, in, in type 1, DCS type 1, and DCS type 2. So the hallmark of type 1 DCS is joint pain, a really, really boring, um, uh, deep joint pain that isn't affected with movement, uh, extreme fatigue, skin bends. So it may be subtle, but it's there, I promise. Um, this is a lacy red rash here called cutis marmorata, um, which is what happens when you get skin bends, lymphatic bends. Um, like I mentioned, it'll be swelling in, arm, uh, in weird places like arms or um, formerly thin individuals. And I'd say, hey, it looks like I've got a fat tire and look at me just two days ago on the beach. I actually have abs, um, that kind of thing. DCS type 2, meanwhile, the hallmark of that's going to be um, neurologic symptoms. Um, they may be central nervous in, in the brain um, versus in the spinal cord. So tingling, numbness, weakness, frank paralysis, um, urinary retention. It also uh, can involve pulmonary decompression sickness or what's known as the chokes. It's a lot more rare. Um, or inner ear, um, also known as vestibular uh, decompression sickness, um, which is also um, quite rare and usually involved in um, uh, odd, odd gas mixtures with things like helium um, and usually more technical diving. So this is some footage of a um, bent diver, diving fisherman down in Mexico. He's undergoing hyperbaric treatment. You can see, um, ¿Cómo se sientes? Second here, Dr. Tech is going to start calling out to him. Huh? 
working on giving him instructions. He's pretty lethargic right now, having trouble following the man. Pretty out of it. So, with lots of episodes of primarily type 1 DCS, you can end up with some downstream effects, um, something called uh, disparic osteonecrosis is an example, um, or DAWN. Um, so, this is ischemic death of both bone and bone marrow secondary to DCS. So, ischemic death or ischemia basically means that the, the tissue downstream isn't getting enough oxygen, uh, primarily due to a blood supply issue. Um, and so this is a major source of morbidity among diving fishermen, and this has been well described for years throughout the world. So on the right here, you've got the femur going into the head of the femur, and this is the hip joint here with the pelvis if you're not used to looking at x-rays. And this margin here is nice and smooth. Um, Contrast that to this right here, which has this osteonecrosis. So looking at the femoral head here, it's no longer smooth and so spherical. This is collapsed. So this is actually pretty bad osteonecrosis, pretty bad dawn. Um, there's some scar tissue as evidenced by this increased calcification here, which is actually not a good thing. And so, I, so susceptible bones um, are gonna have this yellow bone marrow, and, and that'll be in contrast to red or hematopoet, hematopoietic uh, bone marrow. So the red marrow is gonna be the bone marrow that produces your red blood cells. So the bones that are most susceptible to dawn are your longer bones, the humerus, the femur, and the tibia. And um, you won't see dawn in the breastbone, the sternum, your ribs, fingers, things like that. So it's going to be primarily in those three bones. And it's going to occur in the ends of the long bones, the epiphyses, because that's where there's the most fat. So those areas of the bone where there's the, the yellow mar marrow is going to have slow nitrogen wash-in times and by correlation, slow washout times. Uh, and that's a result of poor blood flow, which then makes them susceptible to ischemia. So if a bubble gets trapped in there, it's less likely to get pushed through. It's liable to get trapped and then enlarged and cause a lot of this boring type pain that you'll see with DCS type 1. And that's from literally bone dying. So I did a study here um, in um, TZ Mean looking at 39 fishermen um, from a couple of the fishing villages, Rio Lagartos and San Felipe. We did nine x-rays uh, per fisherman, and we also surveyed their diving behavior. Sounds like a simple um, research study in theory, but it was actually rather logistically challenging, getting money across international borders, getting almost 40 fishermen uh, to travel an hour um, to the nearest uh, healthcare facility that we could rent out, um, which consisted of this uh, clinic where we did x-rays on a 1960s x-ray machine that had the old school um, films that have to be looked at with a light box, not the kind that you'll see here when you go get an x-ray for um, uh, concern for a broken ankle or something like that in our local emergency departments. So quite a bit different. So doing the survey, i um, like to draw your attention to some descriptive statistics that we have here. So the age um, was, uh, they tend to be in their, their mid 40s, but there were some fishermen who were diving um, up into their 60s, and there were obviously some young guys. Um, the BMI was elevated, they were obese. Um, that is a problem that that population uh, in that part of the world does suffer from. They do have high rates of obesity. They all had quite a bit of experience diving um, and fishing. So the minimum that, th that we found was 10 years. Uh, and then I'll draw your, episode, uh, your, uh, your attention here to the episodes of DCS. So they average nine, and again, these are nine trips to the chamber. 
these are not just, hey, my shoulder hurts after a day of diving. I'm going to um, drink some alcohol, um, take some NSAIDs, some anti-inflammatory medication and sleep it off. These are nine, treatment, uh, nine treatments at minimum that they each had to undergo. Um, I did manage to find a unicorn. There was one guy who uh, claimed that he had never undergone decompression sickness, although truth be told, I don't know how much I believed him because um, pretty much all the fishermen there have had decompression sickness. Um, and yes, this is not a mistake. Um, there was one fisherman who was into the 30s for episodes of DCS. Um, and the average depth, I had to convert this to meter seawater, so it's about 40 some odd feet of seawater. And this is a histogram um, that goes over um, some of the results of what we found, uh, some of the results of what we found. So about 77% of the fishermen that we surveyed had evidence of dysparic osteonecrosis done. So um, this is among the highest uh, percentages, even among artisanal diving fishermen um, that I've been able to find in the literature. Um, and the majority of the divers that we surveyed over 50% of all divers actually had at least two joints affected. So pretty big deal. I'd like to switch gears now um, and bring up um, some basic chemistry and we'll talk about kind of the next, um, the next concept here and the next uh, um, ailment through dive medicine. So Boyle's Law, um, so you guys may remember this um, from dive class. It's something that every diver has to get familiar with and be aware of because it's something that comes into play with every single dive when you clear your ears. Um, so it's the relationship between pressure and volume. Um, they are inversely related. So P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. So if I am at sea level here, uh, and I have a pressure of 1.0 atmospheres absolute, that's one ATA, um, and I define my volume as one blowfish worth of volume here, and then we go on a dive and we double our pressure, so we go down to 33 feet of seawater, that's where 2.0 ATA lies, um, that's gonna give us half, um, half a volume of blowfish, that's one half blowfish, then if we add another atmosphere of pressure and go down to 66, 66 feet of seawater, we're down to a third blowfish volume. And then almost 100 feet of seawater, we'll be at one quarter blowfish volume. Now, if we turn the tables and we define um, at 4.0 ATA, uh, our blowfish here as one um, and one blowfish worth. If we then come up to, to two atmospheres absolute, um, where we have 33, where we're under 33 feet of seawater, that'll be two blowfish. And then back at the surface, we're at four blowfish worth of volume. So this is important in talking about barotrauma. So today I don't have um, time to talk about the barotrauma of descent, although you guys are all um, pretty familiar with this and why you need to clear your ears. Let's talk about the barotrauma of ascent. So one of the ways that divers can get into big, big trouble um, is this way. So here you have an al alveolus, um, uh, plural alveoli. So that's going to be a, a cluster of space where gas is exchanged in the lungs there, a cluster of these tiny um, uh, spaces that look like grapes. And as we go up, if you do not exhale, you're at risk for rupture and causing what's called a pulmonary barotrauma, um, which in turn leads us to a possible complication of that, which is arterial gas embolism, AGE. So um, this can actually contribute to mortality, immediate mortality in divers. Um, it's pretty rare, um, so less than 5% of all cases in scuba um, generally, but it can lead to apnea, um, so not breathing, uh, unconsciousness, and cardiac arrest. The symptoms are usually quick onset, so within 10 minutes of, of surfacing, um, and a lot of times they'll have neurologic symptoms associated with it, seizure, passing out, things like that, um, but sometimes paralysis. And it can be hard to distinguish from decompression sickness and, and 
and this gets into um, the subtler points um, of what I have to do clinically when I'm evaluating a, a patient who's in the emergency department um, for hyperbaric treatment. So comparisons between AGE and DCS. So there's gonna be a few things that we look at. Um, so what's the dive profile? So for AGE, did they have a rapid blow up ascent and they forgot to exhale, they held their breath for whatever reason? Um, or decompression sickness, did they do a very provocative dive like that 32 year old um, fisherman from El Puyo whose case I reviewed with you? Um, or were they diving in an aquarium at 18 feet for an hour and then they came up and started having some sort of symptom? That's not gonna be decompression sickness. You need that gas load. Um, and then what was the time frame for the symptom onset? Was it just a few minutes or was it a few hours later? Was it after they boarded a plane after a too short surface interval? And then what sort of symptoms did they have? Did they pass out? Um, was there some sort of paralysis that was evident or were, are we talking about um, more joint pain and things like urinary retention? So, I'll do another video here. No sound on this one. So this is from a European military. This is a training exercise where this diver is going to do a free ascent. And you will see an AGE happen before your eyes. Um, so in a second here, he takes off his mask, takes off his regulator, and he's going to start ascending this. And this is a controlled setting up a, in a pool. He's going to work his way hand over hand. And up here, um, there's there's a rescue diver who's going to come down. You can see very few bubbles exiting this diver. He's holding his breath. He's not exhaling. Tap, tap. Hey, open your airway. All of a sudden, bubbles start coming up. We'll switch angles here. And then now it's the massive production of bubbles coming up. And look at this. This is like a bubble factory coming up. And he's going to hit the surface. He's still conscious. In a second here, we're gonna switch angles um, to an underwater um, angle again, as he's gonna make his way um, to the edge of the pool. And I want you to pay attention to his right leg and what happens when he's kicking. So you can see he's kicking well here, continues to kick and he's gonna get paralyzed in a second here and you will see it right there. And you might see a little bit of jerking here and there. So maybe a couple of kicks right there and then the paralysis again. So that's how quick an AGE can happen in, in that shallow water, even shallower than that, than that pool. So that diver actually ended up doing okay because he was taken to uh, a nearby facility and underwent hyperbaric oxygen therapy, recompression therapy. So um, this is a, a um, schematic depicting uh, one of our workhorse treatments, especially for uh, bad decompression sickness and um, AGE as well. I'll just draw your attention. These are uh, down here, so 285 minutes. Um, so these are not short um, treatments and they can get a lot longer than that, 12 hours even. Routine treatments are only a couple hours and those are used for things like wound healing, um, that sort of thing, um, which I have a separate talk on that. That's a whole nother um, discussion. But there's episodes where they're going to get 100% oxygen and then tear, take air breaks in order to not undergo a seizure at depth, which we can cause in anybody if we give them enough oxygen. And there'll be a, a stage decompression there um, in order to get out safely. So currently um, with the diving fishermen down in Mexico, we do have um, multiple other studies going on. So um, we are in the process of um, working on a manuscript, looking at something called um, Peyton Foramen Ovale, a PFO. Um, so that's a structure in the heart um, that's left over from how the heart develops. Uh, and basically it provides a alternate pathway to allow blood to, en uh, to enter the left side of the heart from the right side. So the right side is gonna go through the pulmonary circulation. The left side is gonna be the circulation in the rest of the body. So this creates a shunt. Um, and so um, in, in the normal population, uh, somewhere between about a quarter to a 
third. And that's what I've seen quoted. I, I hear various different numbers, um, but about a quarter to a third of, of people walking around um, have a PFO, uh, this Peyton Freeman O'Valley. Um, in divers, the concern is that, hey, with maybe a bubble load, if there's bubbling from the tissues going through the veins, uh, and if there's a large enough PFO, those bubbles could potentially cross over into the left side of the heart. And then from there, they can go to the brain or other organs in the body. If they stay on the right side, they can usually be eliminated through the lungs and not be that big of a deal. On the left side, that's where we worry. And so um, this is the start of a bubble study here. And this is actually normal for these cycles. This is an ultrasound. This is the right side of the, the patient's heart. And these little, little white dots are bubbles. This is not a bubble here. This is actually the heart valve. And then this shower here is with a lot of bubbles that we instill by agitating saline. And you can see actually some bubbles starting across. So this is a positive PFO. So we're looking at, at that um, among these uh, fishermen to see if they have maybe a higher rate um, than the one quarter to one third um, that we see quoted. Um, early results that we've had uh, seem to indicate that there is a higher rate of PFO that we saw. Um, then also we want to better characterize uh, these guys dive behavior so for several years now um, uh, Walter and Oswaldo have been uh, putting dive recorders on um, the diving fishermen these are these don't have any sort of readout um, until later until they're downloaded but they do record time and depth so we can get an idea of what the fishing effort is are these guys doing more bounce dives or are they staying down longer um, and then trying to use that to model their tissue loading um, to in turn try and optimize some sort of safety stop for these guys we'd like for them to to be able to do a safety stop and a realistic one so you might be asking yourselves, hey, if these guys are getting bent so much, why don't they change their dive practices? Why don't they adopt the safe dive practices that you know, the US Navy uses, recreational diving uses, the military, militaries across the world use? Um, and the reason has to do with a balance between financial pressures and then health, right? So they've got a lot of financial pressure on them. So if they're in a patch of sea cucumber and they can fish it for an hour and they're at a hundred feet, they're going to fish it. Um, that's money that they're going to be leaving behind if they only stay for 20 minutes. So they're going to push the envelope and most of the time they get by. Okay. And there is a, and there is a treatment chamber, not too, too far away. It's not close, but a lot of them have undergone multiple treatments and been okay and not seen the down, downstream effects, the sequelae from their DCS. Unfortunately though, every year, there's a few of them who died due to various um, reasons, equipment malfunction, AGE, really bad decompression sickness, other comorbidities in their health while they're diving. So um, these guys are taking risks um, and they, they know it, they have a good handle on that. But one of the things that we'd also like to do is better provide them with information, hence like the dysbaric osteonecrosis study. So a bunch of them weren't aware that this could affect their joints. Um, MRIs of the brains may be down, down, down the road for us um, to be able to show, hey, do they have lesions in their brain from the multiple episodes of decompression sickness? So, that's kind of what we've got in the immediate and, and further off um, future. So I'd like to, to wrap things up and say thank you. Again, primarily, I, I really have to thank Walter Chin and um, Dr. Huching Lara. These are the two principals, not me. I, I've, I've joined and I, I've certainly done some things um, and, and been integral in, in running a lot of the studies, but these two have been the, the, the two spearheads and the, the point people on, on getting this study done for many, many years, finding the funding um, and, and managing the logistics of getting supplies and, and money across international borders and getting the, the fishermen to really buy in. It's, it sounds simple on the surface, but if you've ever done field work, this is actually rather complex and quite a feat. Um, I'd like to also thank a couple of my mentors um, over at UCSD, Ian Grover, Anthony Madoc, um, Tudor Hughes is a phenomenal radiologist who helped us out with our Dawn study. 
the San Diego Center for Excellence in Diving, um, which supplied a lot of the funding that allowed me to go down to, to Mexico multiple, multiple times. And then, uh, of course, um, none of this would be possible without the cooperation of the fishermen and the population down, especially in Rio Lagartos, but throughout the Yucatan. They've been phenomenal and a really, really um, fabulous group of people to work with. So with that, I'll go ahead and open it up to, to questions. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. I know I've already learned a few things and we do have a few good questions here. Cool. Uh, it looks like one of our first ones you, you started to address, I think a little bit being, has there been any attempt to try and kind of educate locals about better diving practices? And it sounds like, like you said, it becomes a question of profit or, or not. Um, is there anything else to maybe add to that? Um, yeah, this is a, a, a multi-pronged approach. Um, so um, some of it, and a lot of it has to do with getting buy-in from the locals. And um, I didn't have time to go too deep into this, but um, with those compressors, one of the early problems that Walter and Oswaldo identified was contamination um, of their, their compressed gas, the diver's gas, um, from excuse me, carbon monoxide in the exhaust. So they weren't separating out um, the, the intake. And so um, Oswaldo and Walter, they devised a, a system to try and separate those two gases out so that the intake for the compressor was gonna be separated out from the exhaust. Um, and that was a successful model, I think, for going forward for trying to get these guys to get buy-in on a safety stop. Because what they did was they modeled it and uh, talked to them about the risks, showed them the risks, and showed them that, hey, this was a pretty easy fix. So they helped uh, a handful of the fishermen um, create almost like a snorkel um, for the, the compressors. And then within a few years, all of the compressors pretty much um, throughout that, that community that had seen it were all separating their gases. So they took it and they ran with it. Um, so it's a mistake to think these guys are, are not educated. Um, uh, a lot of them don't have formal schooling, but many of them have actually um, gone on to university. It's just there's not that many economic opportunities for them um, down there. And fishing represents a, a very lucrative um, uh, way to make money down there. Uh, and so getting them to see the long game and, you know, to, to try and reduce their risky behavior, but having them develop that insight on their own, I think is the way to approach it. Right. Did you find this kind of relates to um, one of the questions that Joe just rolled in about why they don't use deco stops? Did you find at any point that uh, fishermen did adopt decompression stops after right hearing more about the effects and seeing buddies maybe go to the hospital so many times or that practice just still kind of hasn't quite picked up a, a full deco stop no um we they seem to maybe be adjusting and considering doing things like um scheduling in some some shallower dives later in the day where they might um do a little bit more off gassing um, things like that. But as of right now, and, and I, we haven't been able to travel down there um, in, in quite a bit of time in part because of COVID. Um, but as of right now, they haven't ad adopted any sort of um, uh, formal decompression uh, stops that I'm aware of. But this thing is also um, very individualized and very personal. So uh, we may just not be aware of it yet. So the fishermen are organized into cooperatives and those cooperatives are groups where they pool their catch and that's how they leverage their buying power. And those cooperatives are actually generally tight knit. And so we could potentially get an idea of what those divers are doing. But then there's also some freelancers that are not belonging to the cooperatives. And then there's people that come in from outside areas. They often don't know what they're doing though. Um, so it's, it's a rather complicated issue can imagine. How about how treatment is paid for? Do fishermen have to pay for that medical care every time they need to go see that, uh, you know, nearby local place? Really good question. So what they do is these fishing cooperatives, they set aside some money. Um, it's a pretty nominal fee 
um, almost like insurance um, that they then pool um, in, into resources uh, as like a bigger pot of money. And from that, um, they purchase things like surface supplied oxygen. Um, before Oswaldo and Walter started going down there, they didn't even, they, they weren't using oxygen. Um, uh, part of the problem was uh, finding um, a place that would refill a medical oxygen bottle. They, they sorted all that stuff out. Um, but then um, the treatments are administered through um, the public health care system in Mexico, something called IMM, excuse me, IMSS, EMS, um, which is like the Instituto Medical uh, Seguro Social. It's basically their social, social security um, safety net that they've got there, but they do set aside um, a small amount of their um, income uh, for payments to this chamber to keep it up and running. Um, so one of the things that we try and do every time when we go down there is to see what sort of supplies we can we can give to the chamber. I have a whole I, I have slides on that from another talk where you know those masks. It's called a Scots mask. Um, looks like the, the, the great pilot mask that you saw um, some of the, the fishermen undergoing. Some of those have broken down with time and the seals are junk and it's leaking oxygen, 100% oxygen into um, the surrounding hyperbaric um, chamber, um, which is a big fire hazard. Um, so replacing those. So they rely a little bit on donations, but in, in part on the, the fishermen's payments and then in part on government payments. I see. Uh, you might have seen the question in the chat from Jean. Uh, there was a couple questions later in there having to do with the gentleman that you shared with us earlier that had been um, suffering from the infarctic thora thoracic area. Um, I don't know if you can see that in the yep, chat. I, as I'm well. right there right now. Yeah. So scoliosis or degenerative disc disease. Um, so scoliosis, uh, I, I don't think so. Degenerative disc disease, um, unknown. But spinal decompor or decompression sickness is a, a, a known complication um, from uh, basically really bad DCS. Um, and it, could the pressure at depth increase the risk of localized infarct in the spinal cord at, at the point of curvature or disc degeneration? So the disc is separate, um, is gonna be separate. And um, I'm trying to remember the exact blood supply um, of the vertebrae, but I think they're gonna be separate. Um, and this is where it gets tricky. So spinal cord decompression sickness, um, there's some controversy actually as to where the bubbles come from. Do they develop from veins, veins elsewhere in the body? But the best thought and the best evidence that I've found is that they actually develop in the spinal cord tissue itself. So right there in the actual spinal cord, there will be some bubbles that start developing cause edema, some of those bubbles will make their way into the vascular space, but they're gonna stay in that edema, or excuse me, in that local tissue there. And then because they're pushing the surrounding tissue and the, and the cells around them, um, they'll create edema and create a barrier for oxygen to come in. So those neurons, those nerve cells, uh, right around those bubbles are gonna die off. And that's what's gonna cause the infarct. Um, one, of the, one of the things that you can contrast is AGE versus decompression sickness. So with AGE, you, you pretty much never see a spinal cord hit. Um, so it's usually to the, to the brain and uh, primarily to the brain higher up. So it's never in the lumbar spine or the thoracic spine. And then let me see, could there be a temporary decrease of vascularity that would cause temporary or permanent leg weakness? Um, at that point, the symptoms that he was having were um, we're all consistent with an isolated spinal cord lesion. So if we hear bilateral lower extremity, so leg weakness, but no upper extremity weakness, and it's on both sides, that's, that's a, a pretty much almost always a, a spinal cord lesion, a spinal cord insult. Wow. I never even knew before this that uh, things could occur in your spinal cord related to, yeah, dive, dive injury. Um, I know we're just after seven, but if we have time, I think maybe just two more questions. Uh, it looks like, how long was the study you conducted on the divers? Was there a certain period of time you primarily got that data from? 
Um, which one is that in regards to? Um, let me see. Uh, from Bridget Williams. Uh, Not too far from the bottom, actually. Um, how long was this study? If this was in regards to the disparic osteonecrosis study, so we surveyed those guys over about a week. It was pretty intensive. Um, the actual, um, so the bigger study of looking at this population and trying to make a dent in um, their rates of decompression sickness has been upwards of 10 years. And it's got lots of different arms and spinoffs. So the carbon monoxide study um, where they did the separation of the intake and exhaust, that was some years back. Um, the, dive, uh, the dive recorder study where they're doing um, uh, a better characterization of the dive behavior. Um, I'd have to ask Walter about uh, exactly how long, but I wanna say that's on the order of uh, like five to seven years, and we're talking tens of thousands of dives. It's a big, big data set that they've got. Um, wow. So hopefully that, I, and then as far as the PFO study, um, that's been over the course of probably off and on a couple of years, a year and a half to two years. Um, you know, we go down there and try and knock out as much data as possible within reason and try and time it so it's not during sea cucumber fishery, uh, the fishing season um, so that we can actually get time to study these guys because, um, you know, they, they have some time off, but that's primarily going to be dictated by weather. Otherwise, they're out there fishing for whatever they can catch, you know. Right. And then how do sea cucumbers end up on the market? Um, yeah, it looks like there's a few things that maybe go into that, whether it's the marketing, if they actually taste good. Um, yeah, yeah well, I think the, the market is primarily um, in Asia. So um, I don't know enough about um, Chinese culture uh, to be able to intelligently um, uh, describe why um, it's eaten there. But that's where it's been more traditionally eaten. Um, the, it's not part of a, the tradition, traditional Mexican cuisine or Yucatan cuisine down there, or even Mayan cuisine. Um, as far as I know, there wasn't a, a cucumber fishery before, gosh, I'd see somewhere in the 15 to 20 year um, range. So back in like the late 1990s, um, to my knowledge, uh, down in that section of um, Mexico, there wasn't even a fishery for it. Um, and the prices vary wildly. I've heard um, in China, sea cucumber can go for 60, the equivalent of $60 for 100 grams, whereas locally here, you saw the 54 um, per pound. Um, so uh, I, I'm sorry, I just don't know enough about the economics um, to comment beyond that. Sure, but it sounds like it's a pretty recent phenomenon for the most part and that demand is potentially going up from from what you've seen and studied yep and unfortunately this is this is a worldwide um thing so um the the demand gets created so i didn't show it but what i've been told is um there are middlemen that come in um uh, to these fishing communities and basically um talk to the fishermen and say hey are there sea cucumber and then basically they'll create a market for it and the fishermen will start fishing for it until basically it's fished out and we're fast approaching that i think in this area of yucatan other parts of mexico to my understanding have had um sea cucumber fisheries collapse um, uh, due to um, over exploitation so there is a mexican regulatory um agency that sets the quota um, for how much um, how much uh, sea cucumber they can take in a particular season um, but the reality is that there's a lot of poaching going on including for some uh, from many of the fishermen that we um, uh, that we uh, that we interact with um, it's an economic thing um, enforcement is very lax there if at all um, and like I said, it is big money. So, you know, just from that single fishery alone, which will last a couple of weeks, maybe a month, um, they can get upwards of half their year's income. Um, so like I said, big money. Wow. Yeah, that's remarkable. It's amazing, in fact. Uh, yeah, there's been so many good questions rolling through, but just to be mindful of everyone's time, uh, unless there's one that's super burning, I think we can, we can probably wrap things there. Thank you again so much, Dan, for sharing your time. Uh, I am going to stop recording before I announce who the winner is, just so we have some kind of separate parceled things. But yeah, uh, for thank those you so much. 
Thank you for everyone. that. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'll be in touch with you here here soon. Uh, I'm just going to record here. Okay.